Right, just making sure we are alive. We are live, it looks we like. We are live, all right. All right, welcome to the Phys Ed Summit, hosted by SB Chat. My name is Matt Eichel, and I'll be your moderator tonight. All right. All right, welcome to the Phys Ed Summit. Uh, we would like to thank the Fizetagogy Phys crew for creating the Phys Ed Summit and helping out SB Chat along the way. Uh, tonight we're going to use a lot of technology and during uh, the session it might go wrong because technology sometimes sucks. Uh, so we are trying some new things out. You'll find there's the chat feature next to the YouTube live video on the right side. It should be on the right side. If you have any questions or comments, please use the chat feature and I'll uh, make sure to uh, get it to our presenter tonight. In the event that technology fails, we'll use the chat feature to update you and also update the SB Chat website as quickly as we can. Uh, if you're using social media, we'd like you to use two hashtags. First of all, hashtag SB Chat and hashtag Phys Ed Summit for your posts. All right, and without any further ado, we are going, I'm going to introduce tonight's presenter, Rich Wiles from Maryland, who will be talking about the periodic table of physical education movements. Take it away, Rich. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Rich Wiles. I uh, teach elementary physical education in the state of Maryland in the United States. And uh, kind of today, we're, tonight we're going to be working on a couple different topics and kind of just rolling through with a kind of a concept that I've been working on over the past year. And uh, we're going to have some fun with it. Uh, hopefully it's an enjoyable topic. Matt will keep me uh, straight on the back channel since I don't see the YouTube live uh, comments. So uh, we're going to have some fun with this tonight. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, put them into that box. Uh, tonight's topic's a little different. Uh, it's, it's kind of like a hybrid of a lot of different concepts. And uh, we're going to kind of put it all together. And the first thing I'm going to need to do is to share my screen with you all so that you can see my beautiful. Here we go. Oh, yeah. It looks like everybody can see it now. So here we go. So hi, uh, yeah, so for this, uh, if you need me, um, I'm on Twitter. If you have any questions you want to ask me or if you want to back channel, I'm at uh, Rich underline Wiles. So uh, please hit me up on Twitter if you want to know things. So this session is kind of a, it's kind of like a hybrid session. I, uh, last couple of years, about a year ago, I started playing around with this concept and uh, kind of just throwing it out there and seeing what social media thinks of it. And uh, kind of, it's it's a different way of teaching, and uh, it should be kind of fun to talk through and see if anybody has any com comments and stuff. So it all started. My journey was, uh, and probably everybody in under undergrad used this wonderful wheel. So this is the movement analysis uh, framework. So this was the wheel that uh, most of us learned off of, and it, it was used in college. It is out of the Graham Holt. And I'm forgetting the last authors of the book, but it, in their book, they had this wheel. And I guess the best way to describe it was when we were undergrads, they put a clothespin, not a clothespin, but uh, one of those things in the middle of it, and it would all spin and uh, move around freely. And I think the cool thing was it kind of broke down everything that we taught in physical education, and it made stuff very simple. So the movement analysis framework was very simple. In the movement analysis uh, framework, it was designed to show how movement concepts and skills can work together to create relationships towards functional movement. The wheel also developed age-appropriate progressions for fundamental movement. It's kind of led to your skill themes approach. Uh, in that book, it talked about pre-control, control, utilization, and proficiency. And uh, it was the children movement book, and uh, Parker was the last author on that. And this kind of was always the gold standard, uh, the skill themes in physical education in undergrad. Our, in the United States, the national standards uh, K to 12 uh, kind of are based off this uh, concept. And it's very much, they're all there in one different spot. And uh, what shaped it a couple years ago was they took this and then they made it into a simplified uh, scope and sequence for us to explain. So we had emerging patterns, we then had uh, maturing patterns, and then we had application. And uh, 
over the years, this has kind of been what a lot of people use. This is uh, this chart is really what a lot of people use more than the grade level outcomes, as much as I hate to say it. So uh, this is where we were, and this is where the scope and sequence is. And then off the same wheel was then we also had assessments designed off of it, like the PE metrics assessment, which was based upon a four point rubric, which would work off those different levels. Uh, and this is what it would look like. And we all had all these different uh, checklists off of it. And it all came through because of this wonderful wheel. So this wheel is, been, is a very important part of the wonderful physical education model. And what we, what we're, we're learn, we, we learn as an undergrad. So the idea was I like the wheel a lot. But the problem is the wheel does not translate over into my teaching. So uh, last year, I started playing around with why do we use it? And uh, how could, why do we use it? And how could this work in, in our classroom? And my thing is, you know, the wheel's great, but I, I wish I could find a way to teach off of it. And uh, that's what I kind of been playing around with the past year. And I guess my reason, my real reason was why not? So I love that the wheel is, uh, it can move and it can move into the different areas and quadrants. But my problem was in the wonderful world of, uh, I guess I like the world of where people push the boundaries of sport. I had a hard time fitting in where the movement w would work all together because the wheel was only a unidimensional wheel and it was hard for me to understand the wheel in that aspect. So I'm thinking of guys like Laird Hamilton who, you know, surf giant monster waves and have a credible fitness. And I, I don't see always how, they would work into that wheel design or our national standards. And so I kept playing around with this idea of how could we keep growing? Laird Hamilton is very good at that. If you don't know who Laird Hamilton is, he uh, started the big wave surfing world. He started going after those monster uh, 90 foot waves. There's really a new biography about him out. Uh, Laird also works on many different things. And uh, the big big thing Laird now does is foil surfing. And really, if you've ever paddled a stand-up paddleboard, it is uh, really, uh, he started that trend back up. So he, so I always try to figure out people like him, how, can, how could we go and why not are we then trying to push what we've been doing over time? So do we need to evolve? Uh, Alex Honold, who is on the screen right now, is a very good example of that. He's done that in... The wonderful climbing world. He did this very much climbing, and he was one of the guys. He lives in his van outside Yosemite. He travels all out throughout the world, and Alex then decides he, he doesn't want to climb with ropes anymore. While he does climb with ropes occasionally, he likes to do a sense that most people wouldn't want to do. And his idea was he could climb El Cap, and when El Cap was originally originally climbed back in the day. El Cap, uh, when it was climbed, it took many weeks. He just did this climb in one day. And it's a very impressive. And he did it with no ropes or not, no equipment. So my idea was, how could we take our basic wheel and how could we evolve it into something that we could, I could use in my classroom every day? Because I wanted to prove to my kids that all these things on this wheel could be all interchanged and all work together harmoniously. So the idea of that came out to the concept of where I am now, and I'm going to kind of explain you where we're uh, going with it. So it's going to be kind of fun. And the wheel is been now made into a periodic table concept. And this is, I'm going to show you kind of where I started and uh, where I'm going today and how it's impacting my teaching with this concept. So the original idea was I took that wheel, and then I started working with these things called the grade level outcomes. And I started trying to put them, try to put them all together and make them into their own world. So the idea of the periodic table concept was very simple. What I wanted to do was to make relatable elements, as I call them, for students to learn off of. So that in the 72 classes that I teach throughout the year, uh, the cool thing is, is that I wanted to find a way that so year to year my kids could understand what I'm doing. If I did, wasn't hitting a standard, I, they would still have a relatable piece to it with those elements. So this is where the concept kind of started. The concept originally started on a, I'm a big fan of Rocket Book and really the Ever Book now. And the idea was, was I, I took the different sections of the wheel and I broke them down. And I, what I did was I started putting them into families. And 
the way it would work is I, I kind of tried to put it out there where uh, we could kind of have them grouped together in different parts of the family. And this is kind of where I started. And I started adding the just the letter of the element, and I started trying to work it together. I then was kind of just taking different parts of the wheel and breaking them down into different sections. And it was kind of a, just a learning process. And I would just upload my notes into Google Drive, and then I would sit on it for a little while and figure out how I could get it going. And then my next question was, how could I link it to Classroom? So the idea was, and this is kind of where I've been going with it, is can you build a bond for your students? And my idea was that you could pick your elements, and that would lead you to making quality physical education lessons. And then you would add your standards in with it. And then the idea would be that for homework, the kids could link it to what they're doing at home for physical activity. So that's where I was hoping to go. And the reason I was going this way is, Joey, who was just running the PE chat, always preaches of adventure. And I, I like his idea of adventure where, you know, health and then physical literacy leads to adventure. And one of the big things that I wanted to do was try to figure out a way that my students would understand this. Because I think sometimes students think physical education and physical activity are just work. And I wanted to find a way that could relate to what they were doing and make it an adventure for them because I think when things are adventures there you it's a, it's an experience and I think we need some type of experience when we're teaching and I think our things that we do in physical education have to relate to that so this is what led to this wonderful table so the periodic table then went into the development phase after I did all my notes and the development phase went very simple I used a comic life and it was a little tedious and then what I did was I started breaking them down into the different families, the locomotor family, non-manipulative family, manipulative family, effort family, spatial awareness family. And then what I started doing was giving them each an element uh, letter. And this led to my first creation that I created. And I tried to put it together on just simple blocks because I thought it would make sense if I put it onto a poster. And the poster idea worked well. But the problem was the poster was not, I couldn't manipulate it. Does that make sense? So when you, I put it on the wall, it was uh, just one of those pieces that would just sit there. And I thought it was really cool. And I, I thought it was cool to work with, but it, it didn't function in my classroom really that well. So from there, I kept, I finished it up. And then our last unit, so in our periodic table, when I originally started was I had a locomotor family, non-manipulative family, manipulative family, Effort family, spatial awareness family, and then I had relationships. And uh, relationships I classified as in yellow. And that was uh, the different body parts with objects and alongside. And I kind of just started trying to put it all together and made it, can you make a bond with phys ed? So I started doing that, but it was it, it, it didn't flow with my lessons. I felt like I was forcing it into my lessons, which became the issue. And I, I didn't want to push it that way too much. So I started then thinking of a different way I could approach this. And I thought the easiest way that I could approach it, approach it was I would make the element families of phys ed, and I would make them into their own little graphic in uh, Canva. And the way I looked at it was was I needed to find a way that I could make posters that I could use A as uh, academic language, but I could also use as elements. So it kind of served as a dual purpose in my classroom. And uh, it went fine. This is the one I used for locomotor uh, family, and I, I did that in red. I kind of just went with some of the original old wheel colors. I tried to, tried to update them and make them look prettier, and I think that's where I went with it. And just kind of made it so it would be eye-catching. So of the elements, we had element one was locomotor, because I feel like locomotor does deserve the number one spot. We use it the most. It's in pretty much everything we do. We're always walking, run, jump. We hop, slide, gallop, skip, and leap in many different ways. And this was going to be the locomotor family. I did give each locomotor family a their element, too. It was just a, I don't know if I, I like that, but it, it seems to work well when you have to group them together a little better. I gave it an element letter. I gave it the name and the definition. And what I did was I made these little cards. And these little cards right here is, I, I originally made them on a giant 8 by 12s And they were really cool because I could uh, put them on my, you know, dry erase board underneath my outcomes. And they worked really well. But the problem with them was, was they were too big. So I tried to put them on a wall and it just didn't work. And 
the idea was that I had to figure a way to make some type of teaching style that was a little different. And the one thing I use a lot is I have a giant wall in my gym, and I decided I need to fill that wall up with all the elements. So what I did was I got rid of my original word wall, and the next creation became I started making the periodic uh, table version 2. And this is what I'm using this year as I teach. And what I did was I uh, took the different elements and I put them and categorized them just like they were on the poster that was originally like this. And I put them on the wall. But this time what I did was I backed them so they would look a little more uh, eye appealing. And I also made them that so that each one could be Velcro and they could pop off the wall. So what I'm allowed that to do is I could then pull them off for my lessons and place them somewhere else in the gym, which I'll show you later, where it all flowed together, which is kind of a cool aspect of this periodic table is, is I made the Graham's wheel kind of start, not Graham's, but uh, the movement, the wheel, I started to make it able to be used in my class so that it was relatable. And I thought it was kind of cool the way I set it up was that my students might not always know what the grade level outcome was, but they at least knew what the element we were working on during the day was, which was kind of a different way of looking at the uh, GLOs, which is kind of fun. And it also allowed me, if, if you were teaching like two uh, grades similar, you could use those same uh, elements while teaching. So I had some fun with it, kind of worked it out right there. Hey, Matt, do we have any questions yet? Nothing so far. Just cool. keep on rolling. Everybody's liking it so far. Keep on keep on trucking. Thanks, man. Okay, you're screen sharing and presenting to everyone. Yay. So my next thing was this year I wanted to take this concept and push it a little further. And uh oh, I need my other screen. There we go. Uh and the idea was could I make this into a workable, feasible part of my year plan? And one of the things I wanted to do was was to use the resources that were already out there and kind of put them all together. And for me, I've always been a big fan of planbook.com. And uh, planbook.com very much simplified it for me where that I could then, I kind of took what the exit outcome was, and, and, and this is all concept, everybody. So I, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but I think it's going in the right direction as I'm working with it this year. But what I could do was with those periodic table families, I could pick the elements out of it and then put it into my lesson plan. So I would take the elements that I thought I was needing for spatial awareness, or if I was working with manipulatives, and I would take them off the wall, and then I would I'll link them to my exit outcomes, and I would really start trying to work them into my lessons. So it was a different way of approaching it. So it kind of allowed me to, for and my students to start understanding basic things. So uh, the way I look at it is, for one of the weeks you could work on is I could have I could pull two uh, I could pull two of the elements off and this is how I could start my unit. I could have manipulative and strike with rackets, and these would be two my two element pieces that would be my building block for a lesson. And I would use resources that I found online, and uh, they're all there and they're all listed, and I have them all. They're all on my website, so you can check them out. But what I did was I took the different, I started with two basic elements for the week. And I would start with manipulative and strike with rackets. And this would be the building base of how I was going to teach my lesson. And the idea was, is it would link back, to, everything would link back to the concept of physical literacy. So, which we know. And that physical literacy was that building block that would then hopefully leave students to adventure. And I think this is where phys ed needs to go. And I think is it's not a clear-cut answer of how we get kids to go there. So the next thing I did was I started working in with other concepts that would make the, this wonderful periodic table work in my room. And I had to go to standard space because it's what I do, and it worked really well with the element idea. So, Rich, can I, I just, uh, just get in here? Yeah. There are a couple questions here. Um, First one, uh, Tanner is asking, how well does do your uh, the periodic table, how well does it stay up on the wall? Does it get knocked down very often? Uh, no, I use industrial Velcro. So industrial Velcro is pretty durable stuff. And I also put it high enough off the wall that it is probably, it starts the bob, the base of it starts about four feet uh, at the four feet mark and it goes up to about seven, eight feet. Okay. So I can only reach certain sections of it. Does that make sense, Tanner? 
Any Instagram other questions, day. Matt? Yeah, we also uh, have Dan Kirsch. He's asking, how do you assess if they know the grade level outcome? Do you use clickers at all? Uh, I'm going to get to some of that I'm going to cover in a couple minutes. So okay. I'm going to kind of go with that. Do we have any other questions? Uh, just to know if we can have your PowerPoint at the end. Yes, there is a the PowerPoint is there, and I'll show you where you can find all these resources too. All right, keep so, on going. Cool. So the idea was is I would start with my element or one of the elements from the table, and the idea was would I, I'd use my plans, and I would then pick my elements. We'd work towards physical literacy, and then we'd use standards-based unpacking. And I, I have to give credit to my crew from Boston who uh, and really Joe Bailey, who came up with this middle slide here. And the idea was, and this is just a sample slide I use once in a while for unpacking, was we would select the GLO, determine our evidence of learning, design the assessment, and then plan. And what I would do, would I, I was what I started doing was I figured out how the elements would work with the unpacking. So the next thing I would do is I then would take my GLO, I'd chunk it out, just like you would do for standard space, and this kind of would help me decide what elements I would need to pick for my lessons. And the idea would be that my students would have to be able to demonstrate, identify, and perform the strikes, which work perfectly well with my elements that I picked. And these would be kind of where my elements would be based upon. And my assessment would be, if anybody knows, I, I'm really big into single point rubrics, and this is an old uh, short-handled one I made. So it's kind of a fun one, and this would be my assessment, and we'll talk more about short, uh, what are they called, single point rubrics in a little while. So the idea would be that I, I could plan my lesson, and then each activity I would build in different elements with this. So we started with our basic one, manipulative and striking with rackets. And I then go into my what, and my what would be for my students, uh, this is a fourth grade lesson, what is short-handled striking, and what is the force just to have fun with Star Wars, and both would be applied during this. Uh, if you don't know, these what, how, why signs are found on the physicaleducator.com. They're a great resource. They're becoming standard language. So my students would be introduced to this, and, you'll, and my students don't always see these every day, but they see them in different parts. My students then would head into a warm-up activity. So if this was a standard lesson, and I was teaching this over about two or three days, I could then work in some of the different elements. So for my warm-up section, I could have my locomotor and self-space concepts being uh, my elements being used. With this, for my warm-up, that we would be using locomotor skills and self-space. And you could pick any different ones that you were dealing with in this unit. So my students then would be hitting that because locomotor can be reused throughout the year. Self-space is a very important one, especially with some of the activities that we're going to be doing. So from our, uh, so what we did then was after my students do our what, you could do a simple activity as your students come in with your these two elements, which could lead you to, to an activity like uh, Kevin Tiller has posted, uh, like My Missing Letter. It's just a very simple activity that's a lot of fun. It's all there, and it would be a very simple one to do. I, I'm still working. I was talking to Kevin today. I said, what, what grade level would you go with this? And uh, he said second grade and up. And kind of a cute activity that he's created and it's really pretty cool and uh, it's a great way to work in your uh, wonderful classroom vocab into it too in different learning aspects so it'd be a simple warm-up that you could do with it if you wanted to change these out and more specify on manipulative and striking with rackets you could also do a different warm-up but this is just an example I created for this uh, presentation so you could pick those two elements you would do your warm-up after your students do your warm-up you could then do your how and it's pretty easy. It says I can perform uh, forehand strikes with fluid motion and form during individual partner activities. So that's where I would be going with my lesson, and that's what I kind of would expect my students to do. And then I would go into my skill development, which is my learn, practice, and demonstrate. And with my elements there, for each activity, you can change out your elements of what you're focusing on. But the cool idea is just like uh, good instruction, you can layer the elements on which is kind of a cool way of approaching this concept where you have it all going together. So we started this module back here with these. So then pretty much that this is our unpack from it. And then our how would be this part. And from our how, we would then start taking different elements that we would focus on for the day. So a simple one you could do is uh, if you would you'd pick 
an activity that you can do. And uh, this one is just based off of Pickle Mitt, and I was using the activities from Open because they're easy open source stuff. It's there, and I would take uh, Strike with Rackets is one of my elements that I have, and then Self Space because this first activity would be working these. So these would be the two uh, elements that I would be working with while teaching the lesson, and I would kind of refer back to them. And simple activity would be something like Hello Paddle, where students are balancing a beanbag on top. Uh, students have to stay in self space while they're moving around. As they're doing this activity, they're having to move throughout the whole uh, area. They're working that in, and they're using their different locomotor movements. I could have changed out the element. I could have kept with the locomotor. But I thought strike with racket made sense. And there is also a short handle implement uh, element, and I could have gone with that one too. And we, the students then would be moving through. So the cool thing is uh, the elements can change and you can layer them on as you go. So for the first activity for the Hello Paddle, they would do you know, striking and self space. They'd have to also be moving through general space if I wanted to add that in. It depends on what elements you're trying to like focus on for your year. It's kind of just a different way of hitting it. But the cool thing is you could reuse these elements throughout the year too as you teach so that students are, are getting their knowledge, their knowledge base built up here with this wonderful uh, periodic table. So from Hello Paddle, after the students would do that, they could progress into an activity where we're focusing on maybe an activity where we're doing striking with rackets and force. So the first activity worked on us balancing and moving through space. The next one we're working on is force. So on the force one, my students that would understand that we could act, do an activity like a pancake flipper where we're staying in one spot and we're throwing up and down with our wonderful paddle. And we're working on different amounts of force because the amount of force you apply as you're tossing it up, you need to have the control as it lands back on. So it's a nice simple activity that students work on where they're practicing throwing and catching up and down using small amounts of force. And it's a very simple game that works with the standards and the standards-based approach. So the elements are all there. It kind of works together, and they're all building upon each other. So lesson one, we did striking and self-space. The second activity, we did striking with rackets and force. So I probably, in my class, I teach 30-minute classes. I could probably hit one more activity if I wanted to, or this would be also maybe my activity I would start with for my next class, depending on it. So my first day, that would be kind of the uh, elements I hit. The second day, I get a little more advanced, and you can then start adding on some different layers. So you could then add on a couple of your different uh, elements in here. So we're still striking with rackets for our next activity in self-space uh, using strong force that is strong or light. So it's an easy way you can look at using the different terms in your class, and the students can link one and build the bonds. So we started kind of making basic elements here and making simple bonds simple bonds, and then we started adding on layered bonds so that students could then start understanding that as they went into the, from, you know, controlled stage of the wonderful wheel, and I forgot what my next term is, sorry, to utilization and then proficiency, they could layer on these different levels. So it would be all there in your thing. And students, oops, sorry, one slide up. Uh, and it would be right there. So our next activity would work on to show all these, a simple activity that you could do is something like from Bird Kate, Bir Birdie in the Cage, where students are working on uh, applying, they need to apply small amounts of force or large amounts of force depending on the distance they are from the hula hoop and maybe a poly spot in the middle. And they're practicing striking it over to their uh, target. So with this, the students are then working on their different um, levels of force, how much force they're using, also, is it a strong or light amount of force. It also works on our striking and students are still in their own self space area. So it's a very simple just layering on the instruction with the elements. So we're making those bonds to each lesson they build. So your next activity that you could then go into with, with this would be you would then layer on another element and you would then layer on maybe striking with rackets, force, uh, self space, light, strong, and then adding some general space. And the idea from there would be you could then take these elements and work your way into one-on-one -on -one partner activities so that students then are using all of these different elements on the periodic table and they're then uh, applying them to different activities. So we're then into that wonderful 
utilization and then proficiency level where we can almost play ourselves a game in that tactical approach, which is kind of fun. So it's all there and it's built in. So we went from these, just playing Bert, Birdie in the cage, from there with our elements one on one. And it's a simple way to layer in your lesson. And it's a simple one because, say, I did this lesson with fourth grade and I used these elements. If I then approach the same lesson in fifth grade, I could use a, uh, some of the similar elements. And I can, instead of being striking with rackets, I could be striking with implements. Or I could be striking with a different uh, long handled uh, racket. Sorry, long handled implement. But uh, it, it's all able to work interchangeably together, which is kind of fun. And it's kind of easy because the students then start remembering the different elements as they learn. But it also allows, I think it's easier if we have the ability to look at a whole periodic table, uh, you could totally have it to the point where it, it you could make, possibly hit all those different things on the periodic table in one year through multiple different lessons. So it's kind of a cool way of doing it. And uh, that's where we would go from that. And you could do into one-on-one -on -one partner activities. And this is where we would be if we were doing like a short-handled striking implement game. Your short-handled striking implement game could be anywhere from uh, uh, a modified version of tennis. You could do it as a pickle mitten game or a pickleball game. Uh, Paddles Lamb, any of them could work into this one-on-one -on -one partner activities. Matt, do we have any questions anymore? We, no questions. We've got uh, some people are liking this. Uh, well, we have, even as an adaptive teacher, this relates to my non-readers and can be meaningful. So a lot, cool. of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of cheering for you here. Cool. Yeah, so the idea, guys, is, is I wanted to make something that took a, 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 just an, a, a concept that we all learned and figured a way to upgrade it. So the next step would be in this uh, would be then you could add on another layer. So one on one with partner uh, would be our next thing. So we progress from in self space, you know, striking rack rackets with force, and then we did that here with pancake flipper. We then transitioned into striking rackets, self space with force and strong and light amounts, and we then applied it to birdie in the cage. We then used these elements to this and then you could add on another layer where you're building on those more elements into an activity where you're then adding a partner aspect. So this would be your relationship part that you could use with your students. So this could work in your standard four, very simply adding it into the lesson that you're teaching. So in this next activity you could do with partners in self space, uh, strong, sorry I, could, I should add light too, with force, general space, oh, there's strong and light, sorry. You could also apply transfer of weight with this because you're going to have to move uh, weight a little more frequently with this next activity since we're using partners. And you could be, you're still using your short handle implements. And your next progression you could do is taking it from one person versus one person to uh, 2v2 with partners where you're creating a, uh, a court and you have different people playing in it. In this, in this version, we have a stormtrooper playing with Yoda and Darth Vader on the other side of the net. So it's a very simple way that you could work into then uh, 2v2 with partner. Uh, the cool thing is is the elements and the table work pretty much with uh, any different, any resource you could use so that it would be very simplified uh, language to use with anybody, which is kind of fun and to use. So you, this one, you could see it in this activity and you could use it just a basic jump rope. You could have striking with partner. You're, you're, you have your partners being played. You would have to watch your self space, but also the general space where you're moving. You'd have to make sure you're applying the correct amount of force. And you might have to transfer weight to wherever you're moving to a, for your shot that you're looking for. So it's different ways of kind of taking our different uh, elements and kind of working them. Because I think it's kind of cool when you get to this level, you could also then apply it back to where we then are talking about this guy, Laird Hamilton, who is using many elements surfing, and this guy, Alex, I'm always hard, Honold, and the way he climbs up El Cap, because they are not just using one section of the wheel, they are really taking it and pushing it and using the multiple different parts of it, which is really a kind of a cool way of looking at it. So I like it because I could take my elements Still link them to the GLOs, 
but then I could also take them and push them to the point where I could use them in a recreational or adventure activities, which is kind of a different way of looking at it. So I got a question of, here, Rich. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to butt in there, but uh, no, Derek, Derek Scott's asking me uh, what it looks like on a daily basis. Okay, so the lesson I'm showing you is a lesson that you could use on a daily basis. And I'm going to get to the point where I'm going to show you some formative and summative assessments with it in a second. And hopefully this kind of can figure it all out. Does that make sense? But the way, the easiest way to use it is uh, if you use the different cards, as say if you use the what, how, why, and you use the cards as your vocabulary at the bottom, it's a very easy way to work in the elements. That's the easiest way. And then where it really gets cool is where if you can start linking into formative assessment and summative assessment, it kind of gets fun because then you can use it. In, and the idea is students can start making what I call is making bonds. And uh, I guess the way I look at it is I want students to bond with those elements so that they could use them in life. So that's kind of where I go with this. And uh, it's kind of fun because what I've been doing more and more is with the whiteboards is I, uh, and I'm going to skip around here, but I'll come back to this slide in a minute too. But in the middle of this board is the element and it says, can you make a bond? My kids around it write how they can link to this at home, which is one of the biggest things that I really like is I've just, it, it kind of links together with their learning in the classroom and it allows them then to link it to their wonderful uh, experience they have in life. Another thing that you, uh, this one worked really well when I created it last year and I gave it a couple dry runs through was in the formative assessment world, I also created a basic paper. And on the paper, it was pretty easy. It was a, uh, how can you make reactions? So the element plus you equals adventure. And can you make a bond with this lesson? And what my kids could do is they could write either one element or multiple elements in that block and then plus you. So you are a part of the adventure and you're needed to go on the adventure. And uh, the way it worked was, was in the your adventure box, kids could either link to somehow that they're doing it after school or they could link it to their life or how maybe an adventure that they want in the future and it allowed students to kind of really just start thinking far out there of what they could do if they took physical literacy and kept running with it in their lives so it's kind of a cool way linking it all together and it was just a very simple uh, formative assessment that i could use because in this simple activity my kids would have to know what the element was and what we were talking about for the day. They could put it in here, plus you, they'd equal your adventure. They could write it up. And uh, I, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm not one that, I don't really care what they sometimes put in here. I think sometimes it's more meaningful if the student understands it. So if you wanted to draw me a picture of the person on adventure and kind of explain what it's going, I'm good with it. Uh, I think sometimes it's an easy way to see if the student really grasps it is where they take their explanation of it. So kind of a simple thing you can do with this periodic table. Uh, I have to say that this table is still in flux. Uh, some days I feel like I want to add another uh, family on it. I sometimes want to think maybe a technology family will be added to it or something else. I'm trying to figure that out. I, it's a growing project, and I really just wanted to kind of propose it to everybody so that they could figure out where they would go with it and uh, take it. So the cool thing is this is just a very simple sheet that I, I've made and, and it works really well. And a uh, simple way you could use this is put it in dry erase sheets. They work really great and uh, you can give them out or you can use the old school thing called paper and pencil and do it that way. One thing this year, I finally got some iPads laying around my gym. I think it'd be fun that if the kid, uh, they put their element in there plus you and the student doesn't just uh, they make the adventure up. Maybe they, they video assess it and they kind of tell me where they want to take the adventure. It's kind of where I might want to go with this in the future. So it's kind of fun to see where it's all going in one spot or another. One of the other ideas is uh, we had our, I, this is where that Plagnets thing comes in. Um, Mike Giacola, Joey, and everybody else to contribute, Tanner. Uh, really, I have a couple sets of these around the gym. The cool thing with it is, is I can use multiple assessments on one board thanks to this now. I have the can you make your bond in the middle and I can use the dry erase board so I can ask kids to write on this and I have two sets of the uh, plagnets going in the gym now. So this is the one set some days I use where I use another set on the other wall. And the cool thing is I can then have the kids make a bond with the lesson but also then 
use the plagnets to grade themselves based upon the rubric that we have designed for the lesson. And it kind of links everything back together because we have our standards working with our elements there. And it's a, just a very cool way that kids are understanding the elements, but they're also understanding the GLOs that we're learning. And sometimes, you know, if, if you don't teach enough classes one year of one skill, you might not get it, but at least with the elements, if you're teaching those parts throughout your year, the students will hopefully remember that uh, previous knowledge that they had. So it's kind of fun. Uh, so on this one, like, so if I asked, on this one, say the kids make a reaction or make a bond with the lesson, they could write it here, and then you could also grade them based upon uh, how they felt about the skill with the rubric. Uh, on the top here, where my cursor is near the wow, most of the time I write my uh, what I'm looking for on the rubric, and then we got we use it with the magical plagnet system of wow, got it, getting there, and a not yet, which is a very simple way of doing it. And um, it's just a simple way where I can get two different types of activities. You can also link it in if you use one of the slap graders. You can get a little Hellison in there too, all in a lesson. But it was all originally based around these elements. So it's kind of a simple way of getting in there and getting it going and uh, working with it. So kind of this is where I, I've gone with it. And uh, it kind of works really well. And it's kind of cool to work with. One of the things that I really focused on uh, more and more is I try to I try to figure out how I can use the elements and I'm trying to work it into a summative assessment piece. And I haven't figured out everything. I've written some blogs. I just wrote one blog on this. And I'm trying to work on another one. But uh, I'm still working on single point rubrics and trying to figure out how I can use these with the elements. So if anybody figures that one out, that'd be great. But the nice thing is, even if I'm just using the single point rubric with it, the cool thing is is that it links all together. And because the wheel, you know, back here, sorry, going back a little bit, you know, we had that wheel and then we made it into a, a table concept. And the cool thing is it works with the GLOs. So it works all here and links together, but then, single point rubric here is a very easy way to link the GLO to it. And you see this when, if you look at your different pieces of, of the elements, you know, you're seeing your different uh, wonderful elements in there in that uh, criteria rubric. So uh, racket back and prep for swing, you know, there's your short handled implement, step with opposite foot, there is your transfer of weight, uh, low to high, you're applying force right there. You could, you're uncoiling and you're coiling. You could work that in there and pick, link it to an element and then the follow through. So you could also work in your different levels. So I'm still trying to figure out how to work all the elements into my rubrics. And that's kind of where I hope somebody here watching might understand how to do this. But it's a very easy way to do it. Uh, called a pedag uh, pedagogy uh, really got me started thinking, Sarah GH, on these single point rubrics. I've made new ones where all the GLOs are also listed on uh, the same page for standard ones. And all of it's there. And the idea is that you, in the criteria section, if you use this as a whole class with your plickers, you could only write, you could write the numbers in the concerned or advanced area, but most friends would fall in the criteria area. You could also use this as a self-assessment with your students or peer assessment. And it, it has multiple different ways you could work on it. So it's kind of pretty cool. It's just, it's, I'm, my thing is I'm still trying to work out all the kinks to this kind of concept of a periodic table for physical education. So I'm hoping somebody here who's watching this presentation kind of figures it out, kind of can maybe help me figure out where it needs to go and uh, get it going. And it's kind of the idea is that we could maybe possibly get this movement going, but uh, it's, it's, it's a work in progress. And I think it's pretty cool. I think it has the ability to bring concept and the theory that we've all grown up with and trying to take it to, you know, understanding that our students are going to use it and our students then will hopefully take, make some bonds with it and lead to adventure. So I know I'm a little short on time. Uh, I'll take as many questions as you want, but I think um, I'm really surprised I got that far with the time, truthfully, because this is always this has been like a work in progress for a couple of uh, years, so about a year and a half now. So 
Any questions, Matt, or any comments on where people want to find things? I've got Dan Kirsch is asking me, so this is the single point rubrics or no? He uses plickers. Sorry, he uses his plagnets as well. So I use I use multiple forms of assessment in my room. Uh, I don't just pick one. It depends on how the standard is written. Uh, plagnets are cool for cognitive based, but I also use I use plagnets also a lot for student self check. So that say we were you know working on let me get like one of our basic ones. Say we were working on striking with rackets and self space with hello paddle. So say I wanted to say, you know, did you move through self-space correctly, uh, balancing your wonderful beanbag on your paddle? Were you doing it safely? And uh, if you did it all the time correctly, you could put it in the wow section. If you did it most of the time, got it section. And what I do is I, I write the criteria up somewhere in the gym of what I would expect during that lesson. So that's the way I use the plagnets most of the time. Uh, I think it's the easiest way to use it. I, I like it as a self-assessment or cognitive assessment more than anything. Uh, I've kind of I, I I'm not always a fan of it just because uh, it's a lot of effort to type all the questions in. So I try to use it as much and as little as I think I need it in my class. I use my whiteboards, and uh, there was a blog post uh, Justin just retweeted about whiteboards. I'm a big fan of whiteboards in my gym, and uh, I I have them everywhere. And I really think it's cool because I let my kids just uh, draw on my walls and kind of hope that works out to where, you know, building a uh, reaction, you know, chemical bonds with these, uh, what's it called? With the elements is kind of cool because on this one, like, this is jumping and landing is the uh, element here on the middle of this board. My kids for this lesson wrote different ways you can jump and land out on the playground. And it was covered with different stuff that day from the lesson. And it was all listed up here. And on another board, I had, uh, you know, catching and who you could play catch with at home. How could you make a bond at home? So I, I've kind of expanded out with all my different assessment forms. Uh, and I kind of just keep trying to change how assessment's done. I love plickers, and I think they're great. But I think they have their one, one or two places in the phys ed world right now. And I, I haven't figured out where I love them the most. So I, I think sometimes doing simple stuff like this and uh, – I think you get to know your kids a little more. So it's kind of fun sometimes to read. It is more work, but it, it, it's not horrible. So any other questions, Matt? Oh, yeah, single point, oh. oh, sorry. Single. Let me get single. Single point rubrics are the idea that uh, – I just wrote a blog on this. Single point rubrics are – it's a way to simplify, hopefully, the old school checklist that uh, a lot of us still use and trying to figure it out. So instead of using this – it's easier because you could have with the plickers numbers, you could have everybody's number here on one paper. That's my idea of pushing it that way. Go okay. for it, Matt. Uh, yeah, I had another question. How do you grade with your single point rubric and plickers? You kind of just went over that there. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, that that's how kind of I grade with it in the elements. So it's pretty self-explanatory there. Does that make sense? Somebody else, another question, go for it. Uh, shoot it. And... Uh, Tanner said he'd love to, he'd like to see the table again. Sure. The table, uh, there's two versions. I have ne They're both posted on Phys Ed Resource, which is the site I somehow still run in functions. But uh, the original table was this one, which was three posters, and I enlarged them. And this is where it started from. And this was the original one. This one and this one, and this is just an old Comic Life file, and now it's a PDF. But then I, what I did was these are all made in Canva, and I th they are in a PDF form on Phys Ed Resource, and they're all there already done for you. All I did was I made them into, uh, I put four to a page, and I made them smaller, and then I just backed them with a piece of construction paper, laminated them through, and then threw on some wonderful Velcro on the back of it. And I kind of just then started aligning them. And you'll notice that if you look from this table to the other one, it's a little different. Uh, I haven't figured out the column height sometimes. I think it's also, so uh, it's also, it's, it's, a, it's a concept that, you know, it's going to grow and it's going to change and it's going to evolve. I mean, look where plickers were uh, two years ago. I mean, plickers were a basic card that we used in our hands and now they're a magnetic sheet or a plagnet or where they've gone so i think it's one of those things where i'm just going to put it out there and see if anybody bites at it if not we can just scrap it to the pile and find the next cool thing coming up so 
Pretty cool. Any other questions, Matt? Nothing so far. Nothing so far. I, this was an eye opener for me, Rich. I, I, it's awesome to see all that language used, and it's something that I think uh, I'll take away from this for sure. Uh, my mind is a little bit blown here, so you've uh, you've enlightened me a little bit. Uh, we had a lot of people just really think thinking that this is a very interesting way to articulate the language. Um, they really liked how you uh, brought them back to their high school chemistry days, and uh, yeah, just very very cool. Cool. So. Very cool. Uh, well, we don't have to. If anybody has any more questions, shoot them now, or uh, Matt and I get ten extra minutes to maybe go watch TV and hang with our families. But if if not, it's it's not the end of the world. And uh, it, it's been fun hanging out, and I'm hoping you all enjoyed watching tonight. So sometimes it's good just to throw an idea out there and uh, see what people think of it. And kind of that's where I went with the session tonight. So. Hopefully, uh, Will is rocking his session, too. I look forward to watching in a little while. If you haven't had a chance or you haven't seen Will's stuff, please go check that out, too. So I think that's going to wrap us up for the night, unless we have any more questions. Anything that else? is it. That is it. Oh. I just need to uh, – sorry, do you have anything else to add? No, let's finish up no. and get out of here. All right. Well, uh, you can get your certificate of participation for those who are here tonight by going to the SB Chat website, clicking on the Summit page. Uh, make sure you provide your correct email so it'll be emailed to you in a few minutes. Uh, thanks again, Rich, for this awesome session. You can watch this over again. This is recorded, so hopefully. And uh, we are having sessions all week. We had two last night. We have two tomorrow. We have two on Thursday. So make sure you're coming out every night. And besides that, we are good to go. All right. That is it. Thanks for tuning in.